Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing uh, release of neurotransmitter. Okay, so so far what we have seen is that an action potential propping a, propagating along an axon uh, will uh, reach the uh, axon terminal and there it will cause the opening of N and PQ type voltage gated calcium channels. The N and PQ type voltage gated calcium channels will open and allow uh, calcium to enter the um, enter the axon terminal from the extracellular fluid. This calcium is then going to activate uh, synaptotagmin, well, or bind to synaptotagmin and activate synaptotagmin and at least in the clamp theory what that then does is it removes this clamp protein complexin which is preventing uh, the uh, membrane of the vesicle from getting too close to the membrane of the plasma oh sorry, from the plasma membrane and once that complexin protein has been removed what can happen is these trans core snare complexes uh, can uh, tighten basically and pull the two membranes very close together and that will uh, cause the two membranes to fuse and result in a cis snare core complex forming. Right, so that's how uh, the entry of calcium through these N-type or PQ-type voltage-gated calcium channels uh, causes the release of the readily releasable vesicle pool. What we now want to see is how it also leads uh, to the uh, release of the reserve pool. And it does this through uh, binding to calmodulin, which then uh, forms calcium calmodulin complexes, which can activate uh, CAM kinase 2 which will then phosphorylate synapsins and inactivate them, causing the release of the um, vesicles that, we, as we've seen, are uh, bound to the actin cytoskeleton. Okay, so let's go through that in a bit more detail. Okay, so let me just get a new piece of paper. Right, so uh, let's begin with a little bit of a discussion of calmodulin then. So uh, let's draw a picture of an axon terminal here. Oops. Okay, so here's our axon terminal. Now, basically, we've had calcium enter through our voltage-gated calcium channel. So let's draw that here. So here's our voltage-gated calcium channel of the N or PQ type. So here's the gamma subunit, here's the beta subunit, here's the alpha 2 delta subunit. And this is an N type, in which case the alpha 1 subunit is encoded for by the CAV 2.2 gene, or it's a PQ type, in which case the alpha 1 subunit is encoded for by the CAV 2.1 um, uh, gene. Okay, so this will draw the whole thing in this turquoise colour here. Okay, so in turquoise, this is our voltage-gated calcium channel of the N or the PQ type. And often, voltage-gated calcium channel is abbreviated to VGCC. Now, we've seen how this is going to allow calcium to enter from the extracellular fluid. Now, what can happen is the calcium can bind to calmodulin. So let's have a little bit of a discussion of calmodulin. Okay, so the calmodulin protein then, in cartoons, it's often drawn like so. It has these two lobes, one known as the N lobe, which we'll say is this one over here, and one known as the C lobe, which we'll say is this one over here. And they're linked by a polypeptide uh, between the two. Okay, uh, so it's one protein, one polypeptide, but there is a linker region between the two. Now, each of the lobes of calmodulin has two calcium binding sites here. Uh, so, overall, the calmodulin molecule has four calcium binding sites. And these calcium binding sites are what are known as EF hand domains. So, let me explain to you what is meant by an EF hand domain. So, basically, an EF hand domain is a uh, structure that you can have within a protein which is capable of binding to calcium. Okay, now EF hand domains look kind of like this. If this line represents the polypeptide, then the polypeptide forms this sort of loop, like so. And uh, the amino acids in this loop portion of the polypeptide 
all have uh, acidic side chains, basic, basically. And these acidic side chains are capable of donating a proton away. Now, when they donate a proton away, uh, they uh, gain a negative charge, basically. So let me discuss this in a bit more detail. Let's take an example um, which is of an amino acid with an acidic side chain. So let's take the example of aspartate, or aspartic acid, as I should have said. Okay, so here is the structure of aspartic acid here. Okay, so this is the R chain of aspartic acid, this ethanoic acid effectively sticking off it. And here's the core amino acid structure. It's the alpha carbon, the carboxylic acid group, the amino terminus, etc. So this is aspartic acid. Now, aspartic acid is the correct name for what I've drawn. Aspartate, strictly speaking, is not what I've drawn. Aspartic acid is an acid because it can uh, donate this proton off the um, hydroxyl group, basically, to give you, let me show you what you'll get, if this is the carboxyl group, you can basically cleave the proton off, like so, to give the oxygen a negative charge and the proton a positive charge. Now, the molecule that's left with this, um, with this negatively char negative charge on the oxygen is then an aspartate molecule. Okay. So that's uh, the strict uh, difference between aspartic acid and aspartate. Aspartate is aspartic acid once it's given up its proton. Strictly speaking, it's the conjugate base of aspartic acid. Uh, so uh, when you have an acid molecule, the acid molecule, by definition, is capable of giving up a proton, such as aspartic acid. This structure that is left over after it's donated the proton is then not capable of giving up a proton anymore. So it's no longer known as an acid. Instead, it's actually a base because it can accept a proton on this negative charge here. Okay? So that's why it's known as the conjugate base of an acid. Okay, so basically, if you put lots of acidic side chains in here, some of them will lose their proton and will become the conjugate base. And when they become the conjugate base, they're going to get a negative charge. So you're going to have a lot of negatively charged residues in this loop. Now, calcium is a divalent cation. So let me draw calcium here. It has two positive charges or a double positive charge. Uh, so it's going to coordinate itself amongst these uh, negatively charged side chains that are uh, from the conjugate bases of these acidic residues. Okay, right, so that's how an EF hand domain works. Now, EF hand domains rarely come in, um, in, in, you rarely just get a single EF hand domain on its own. Instead, what you usually get is an EF hand domain like so, and then you'll have a linker region between the two and then you have another EF hand domain sitting next to it. So you often get what are known as EF dimers, basically, which are these dimers of EF hand domains. That means that you'll have a calcium binding site next to another calcium binding site. So the EF dimer overall is capable of binding two calciums. This structure is what you have in calmodulin, basically. And you have these two EF hand domains that are sitting next to each other in each of these two lobes of calmodulin. Okay, so you have an EF dimer in the N lobe and an EF dimer in the C lobe. So, overall, that means there are four calcium binding sites on the whole of the calmodulin structure. Now, before calmodulin actually has calcium bound to it, in this state here, it's known as apocalmodulin. So, this is an apocalmodulin molecule. Okay, now apocalmodulin is often also usually reduced to, it's often usually uh, denoted aposcam, basically. So cam is how, uh, is the shorthand for calmodulin, and it's customary to put a capital C, a lowercase a, and a capital M for calmodulin. Okay, so apocam is the calmodulin molecule with no calcium bound to it. Now, when calcium binds to these four calcium binding sites uh, on the calmodulin molecule, what's going to happen is that it's going to change conformation. And let me show you how it will change conformation. It'll change conformation so that the two lobes move further apart. So it will basically 
um, let me bring it back into the picture, it will basically move out like that. So they'll move, uh, at the moment they're sort of bent back towards each other, it will straighten out and move, and the two lobes will move away. Now, in contrast to the fact that the two lobes are straightening out, this linker region, which before was a linear polypeptide, that does the exact opposite. It takes on a curvy structure. It takes on an alpha helical structure. Okay, so let me draw this sort of spring to represent an alpha helix. Okay, so this is an alpha helix. So the linker, this polypeptide linker, which links the two lobes of the calmodulin, takes on an alpha helical structure. And now these four calcium binding sites here all have calcium bound to them. So calcium is bound here, calcium is bound here, Calcium is bound here, calcium is bound here. This structure now, which is calmodulin with four calcium ions bound to it, is what is known as a calcium calmodulin complex. Calcium calmodulin complex. And again, the shorthand for a calcium calmodulin complex is to denote it as CA2 plus CAM with this capital C, capital M, lowercase a. So that means a calcium calmodulin complex. Right, so what was the point of that entire discussion? Well, that was to give you a brief introduction to calmodulin because it's one of these proteins that you more have heard of but might not actually know what it really is. So I've um, done a little bit of a discussion of it for you there. Right, so back up to the story. When calcium comes in, to the cell, you're going to get calcium binding to the apocalmodulin molecules, and that's going to convert them into calcium calmodulin complexes. So here we have uh, a calcium calmodulin complex. Now, calcium calmodulin complexes can activate an enzyme known as the calcium calmodulin dependent kinase 2. So let me put that name somewhere um, important. Right, so we are going to talk about the calcium calmodulin dependent kinase 2 and I want to give you a little bit of a discussion of this enzyme as well calcium calmodulin dependent kinase 2 because it's one of these enzymes that again you might never have heard of before or you might have heard of but might know very little about so I want to give a bit more of an in-depth discussion of this enzyme now um, calcium calmodulin dependent kinase 2 again it's often abbreviated to CAMK2. So the CAM comes from calmodulin, K from kinase, and then 2. So often it's referred to, people will refer to it as CAM kinase 2. And you should read CAM kinase 2 as meaning uh, the calcium calmodulin uh, dependent kinase, basically. Okay, 2. Okay, so let me tell you about the structure of this enzyme. So the single enzyme has a structure that looks kind of like this. So I'll draw it up here. It has a portion that is known as the hub region here. So let's call this the hub. Then it has a linker region here, which then over here has the actual kinase domain over here. So this is the actual enzyme that is capable of phosphorylating bits over here. Then, off of the linker, it has a portion known as the pseudo-substrate, which basically sticks into uh, the uh, kinase enzyme, the active site of the kinase enzyme, and inhibits it. So let me colour this pseudo-substrate in, and I'll label the different bits up. So this is one calcium calmodulin independent kinase 2 enzyme. So it is one protein, basically. Okay. This is what's known as the pseudo-substrate, or the auto-inhibitory portion. Pseudo-substrate. And this is the reason the enzyme is not constitutively active, because it has this pseudo-substrate, or auto-inhibitory domain. So I'll put it auto-inhibitory domain, that is sticking within the active site of the enzyme and preventing the active uh, preventing the active site from being able to catalyze the reaction which it catalyzes, which is uh, to add phosphate groups onto serine and threonine residues. Now, you also have this hub region down here, which I'll denote in orange, and that's going to be important in the oligomerization of the enzyme. So basically, the enzyme doesn't go around on its own. It, it goes around with a bunch of friends, basically. Okay, and in blue here, 
we have the linker region. So this is the linker region. And then finally, the most important region potentially, the actual kinase domain up here, which I'll do in turquoise. So this is the kinase domain in turquoise. Oops. Okay. So this is the enzyme that is going to be activated by calcium calmodulin um, complexes. And uh, it's then going to phosphorylate these synapsin proteins and allow uh, the release of those um, uh, vesicles, synaptic vesicles stored in the uh, reserve pool uh, so that they can migrate to the active zone. But we'll continue our discussion of calcium calmodulin complex dependent kinase 2 um, in the next video.